everyone, welcome to another episode of Yarn to Table. My name is Celeste and I'm so glad you're joining me today. If this is your very first time watching my knit cast, I hope that you see something here that you like and that you'll hit subscribe so that you can take part in the discussion in the future. And if you are already a part of my small little knitting circle on here, I just want to thank you so much for being a part of it and coming back week after week. So I've got a lot of exciting stuff for you this week. I have three finished, finished objects to talk about. Um, I have some really exciting stash enhancement to take a look at. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my knitting goals for the year at the end, um, as well as the chit chat segment that I promised you about my six week vegan challenge. So um, please kick back, take out your knitting, and let's talk yarn. This week I am drinking the Celestial Seasonings Peppermint Tea. Now before we jump into finished objects, I have a few administrative things to get out of the way. First of all, if you don't know, there is a Ravelry group. You can find it by clicking the link in the doobly-doo or searching for Yarn to Table on Ravelry. And I am also on Ravelry as Celeste Bull, as well as Instagram, so you can keep up with me there. There's lots of details in any of the projects that I share on my Ravelry page, because I keep that quite up to date and the Ravelry group, uh, I hope that you join that because that is where you can find uh, detailed show notes for every episode, as well as giveaways and knit-alongs. So right now, we do have a knit-along currently going. It is the hashtag new socks cal, and the concept behind this knit-along is that you will knit a pair of socks or more um, between now or when the knit-along kicked off last week, and um, and April 30th and it has to be something new, a new technique, a new kind of yarn you've never used for socks. I give lots of examples of the various uh, things you could be doing with socks for the first time in the chatter thread that's on the group. So go ahead and check that out and uh, get inspired and I hope that you will join us. I also have an announcement about that cal. Um, so Andy from the 10,000 Stitches podcast, which I'm sure you are also watching because it's fantastic, has very generously offered to donate some of her hand-dyed yarn as a prize, which I think is great because we can get some sock yarn in there and just have some uh, an awesome sock-related prize for this knit along. Um, so thank you so much, Andy, and I will update you guys with more particulars on that as it comes up. Um, there was another prize that I had mentioned earlier, the Gardener's Mitts Pattern by Yarn and Time Designs. Um, and that's either going to be a prize for this knit-along or I might actually save it as a prize for another knit-along that I will be co-hosting, that I will be um, announcing and giving you some more info on um, next week. So look forward to that. I'm very excited about it. Okay, now it is finally time to jump into finished objects, so I won't try to ignore the elephant in the room anymore, and I'm actually going to take it off because it's a little hot in here. Um, you may have noticed <laughs> I have finished my meandering shawl. Um, so this little bit of brioche goodness is something I've been working on for a few weeks now. It's been my... Um, main source of knitting excitement. It's just been super fun to knit. Um, and I did it out of, um, so this is a Stephen West pattern, and it takes a fingering weight, which is the multicolor, and a DK, which is this pink. So I did it out of the uh, first installment of the local yarn club from a homespun house in nesting, which is the multicolor. And it picks Capra, which is a merino and cashmere blend in flamingo for the pale pink. Um, I love the combination. And the yarn was definitely part of what made this so much fun to knit, although also it was just a really fun pattern. And I think that I'm just a total brioche person. Like, I wanna knit so much brioche now. Um, gosh, it's so squishy, it's lovely. The Capra is so soft because it's cashmere, so I'm like totally in love with that. Um, I definitely had some hiccups on this, as I mentioned before. It is It was my very first brioche. It's definitely more complicated than what I would recommend as a first brioche for someone. I mean, I don't really mind that I have lots of little flaws in it because 
A, it was more of a process knit than a product knit, although I love the product. And, um, you know, I think they hide themselves pretty well in the brioche. Uh, it, they're mostly just visible on the back side anywhere that I screwed something up, like I think I showed you guys this one. And most of my screw ups just had to do with um, dropping some stitches and then not really being able to pick them up properly, which is a big part of, you know, just because I'm a new brioche knitter and I don't think that I have a good enough sense of the actual functionality of the yarn on the needles to, you know, if I, if I drop something, I don't always pick it up um, exactly right. And I think I will get better at that. I think I've already gotten better at that toward the end. Uh, from where I was at the beginning. And I definitely had a bit of a problem dropping stitches on this. It had me work that, um, I want to say like a 40 inch needle, and um, this is pretty large for 40 inch needles. So they were pretty crammed. And when they're crammed like that, and you're like kind of pulling on it, trying to get them to go around the needle, um, it can you can accidentally pull them off the needle pretty easily. So I think um, if and when I make this again, I do think I will be making a second at some point. Um, one of the things I will change is I will probably use a longer needle. Another thing I will change is I will buy more yarn. <laughs> so I don't know if you've noticed, but it's a little bit, it's a little, it's a little bit smaller than it's supposed to be, you guys. Um, this was pretty, it was a little bit heartbreaking. So, obviously, the local yarn club was like a very one-of-a-kind thing. And, um, there was no way to get extra. <laughs> and it, the skein was, um, 427 yards. And the pattern said I needed 420 yards. So that was definitely too close for my comfort. But it did seem like, you know, it might be enough. And so I sized down on my needles just to make sure. And I ran out way ahead of time. So I'm in this border section where you're decreasing here and increasing here. And what it does is it creates a bit of a scallop. And here, as you can tell, I just have a very light scallop. It gets more dramatic as it goes on. So I ran out about five, um, no, about 10 brioche style rows. So like as you would count them, 20 as you would knit them, um, before the end. And I was also supposed to have enough of the nesting to do the eye cord bind off in the nesting, according to the pattern. So I, you know, doing the eye cord bind off in the other yarn was like not a big deal for me at all. I don't, I think that's fine, but the bottom of it just isn't the shape that it's supposed to be and that's pretty disappointing. I, I just finished this like mere moments ago, so I haven't blocked it. Um, if you can tell, it's a little bit, you know, curly. Um, so I'm wondering if I can kind of exaggerate the shape with a, a little bit with some blocking. I think I can probably help it out a little bit in that department. I don't think it's gonna look, have the same look as it's supposed to have with like a drastically scalloped bottom, but I think it would look nicer than it does here where it just kind of looks like it's a little curly rather than looking like it's intentionally scalloped. Um, so hopefully blocking will help me out a little bit there. I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to say about it. Um, just a really, really fun knit. Really good knit. I, I'm disappointed that the estimate on the yarn was kind of off. And I know that I am a bit of a loose knitter, um, but it, I felt like it was really far off. I mean, to have enough to do the eye cord and five more rows in that, no, 10 more rows in that color, that's a pretty far off estimate. So, I mean, I normally wouldn't go up. I, w I wouldn't try to make something that I only had that much yarn for knowing that I was cutting it that close. And, um, the only reason I did is I was just so excited about it and I, and I'm glad I did. Um, but I do think that, you know, in general, I want to be better about not getting into a yarn a game of yarn chicken with myself because it definitely made the end like the last few days of knitting this a lot less enjoyable than they could have been because I was trying to decide how to 
when to end and how to end and what to do and how it was going to look and you know it kind of um it made it not as fun so here's actually the bit of nesting that i have left over and i know you're thinking how does she have any nesting left over at all if she ran out of it well you know it's so long and um i had reached what was a good stopping point and i had these two grams um so i stopped there and I uh, weighed them and my Cozy Memories blanket squares are about three grams, this is about two grams, so I think I'm actually going to knit one with this and just do the little corner of it when I run out, out of some of the pink. Even though it's DK, I think I can fudge it and make it work. Um, Cause I do really want a square to remember this by. So that's nice that I do actually have a tiny little bit left. Um, because I've been looking forward to that square because this yarn, as I've said many times, is so incredibly special. That little bit of green in it there. I mean, sorry, I have hair on it. Um, this yarn, I mean, Molly outdoes herself like every single time. I don't even know if you can call it outdoing herself when it's just consistently, her yarn is so great. Um, yeah, so that's the meandering shawl. I guess I can wear it like this or something for the rest of the episode. Um, I know it clashes with the shirt. I was going to wear, I had it, I had my pale pink cashmere sweater that like matches it perfectly. And, um, and here's the thing, you guys. Last night I had dinner with my parents and I had this like pasta with marinara sauce and I was wearing that pink sweater and I was so careful through the whole dinner I didn't get anything on it it was like totally clean and then I put it on and I came upstairs and I put on a little bit of tinted moisturizer because I was gonna film the podcast and I got like the tiniest little bit on there and the tide stick couldn't get it out well enough and honestly now that I'm sitting here I realized that it was on a spot that was like lower than the camera would even see so I could have just worn it and I didn't know and you know now I'm just giving you guys all of the behind the scenes information so that um you know <laughs> I guess I don't know where I'm going with this except that I, I want it to be clear that I recognize that this Jean and this shirt don't go great together um <laughs> just for the record had a really cute outfit planned and it just did not work out you guys so not everything can be perfect even when you plan it that way that's the lesson okay I have two more finished objects you guys they're so freaking exciting I can't contain myself <sighs> are you ready for this God, look at their look at their little cotton tails. <laughs> oh my god, they're so cute. Oh, they're so cute, aren't they? That's like not modest of me to say at all, but I I take no credit for it cuz I didn't design them and the design is really what makes them incredible. Um, these are Hopsalots by Tiny Owl Knits. They are knitted and then felted, if you haven't been following along on my little Hopsalot journey. Um, and then the face was done, uh, embroidered with yarn. I did a little satin stitch nose and some French knot eyes, and then little pom-poms for the back. Um, as I said last week, the slippers themselves are actually identical. You can tell that there is a side uh, right and the left only because when I felted them I did them on my feet to kind of give them that shape um, the ears are knit and felted separately and then sewn on and the biggest challenge for me was getting the ears to look right and they still don't look really as cute as the ones in the pattern uh, which like flop perfectly so I think maybe if I take like a, a hair straightener to them or something I can maybe like get them to flop a little more. Um, but initially I just pinched them in the front and I had them sewn um, sort of in a straight line this way and they would just flop to the side and they didn't look cute at all. So then I came back and I pinched them this way and sewed them back and forth that way and kind of tacked them on the edges to give them a better shape. So I, um, I've had to futz around 
with the, oh, that's cute. <laughs> Foots around with the little um, ears a little bit, but I think they're looking pretty good. I'm very happy with the color. If you haven't noticed, it's um, the Capra as well in Flamingo. Um, nice little garter stitch sole, which I think gives it a nice texture and thickness. And this was my first experience with anything larger than a ring felting, um, and it was really fun. So I talk more in detail about that actual process in uh, an earlier episode. I think it was last week. Um, so if you're interested, you can check that out. This will definitely not be my last foray into the wide world of felting um, because I'm I'm definitely I'm. I'm in love with it now, for sure. Um, what else is there to say about these? I mean, they're adorable. They need names. I haven't come up with any names for them yet. Um, I was toying around with Rabbit Romaine Stamos, but you know, <laughs> much as it makes me laugh, I'd rather they have adorable names than ridiculous joke names. I'm taking the naming of my slippers a little seriously. I'm insane. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> bunny slippers, yay. I'm an adult. <laughs> oh my God. So my final finished object is not knitted. It is a sewing project. And I talked a little bit about my plans for this earlier when I got the fabric, but a lot of you probably have not seen. Um, this is my Gilmore Girls patchwork project bag. Now, I'm a pretty imprecise seamstress, or I guess people are saying sewist now. I don't really know. I always said seamstress, but maybe that's sexist. I, I don't know. Um, sewer, whatever. I'm kind of sloppy, and I I want to get better. I I think I just don't have the patience. So. This is not as perfect as I would like it to be, but it's um, it's a really fun concept and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm going to be making a second one because I had enough fabric to make two. Um, so maybe that one will be hopefully a little bit more precise. It's a gift for someone, so I'm hopeful that it will be a little more precise. I also might make it a little bit deeper by making a bottom portion out of the stars. Um, because I think this is almost a little bit awkwardly short. So my inspiration comes from Maker's Haven, um, makershaven.com or the Maker's Haven podcast. She made these amazing patchwork bags that were Harry Potter inspired. And instead of having any like um, explicitly Harry Potter themed fabric, she just chose a bunch of fabrics that related to Harry Potter in various ways. And I thought I would like to do something like that for um, something else. And so I chose Gilmore Girls. So as you can see, the stars, of course, are for Stars Hollow, the town that they live in. And then I have lots of Gilmore Girls things, pizza and donuts, which gets referenced a lot. Autumn, um, music specifically David Bowie, because Lorelai loves him. Coffee, coffee, coffee. Dragonflies for the Dragonfly Inn, books for Rory, and snow, obviously. So, um, if you know Gilmore Girls, all of these things will make sense to you as choices. I tried to keep the color palette, um, you know, with all these different prints, I tried to keep a bit of a color palette. And it's, of course, inspired by my favorite colors, so that sort of gray and pink kind of thing going on. I think it worked pretty well. Um, I didn't use a pattern... I just used, uh, so, so the fabric I got as samples, little eight inch by eight inch samples. Each of these is half of a square. Um, and so I just sort of let how much fabric I had dictate the overall size and shape, which is part of the reason why I think it's a little awkwardly short. And then uh, online, I just looked around at, at various different project bags and I got the general idea from several different tutorials, and then I just kind of made it my own. I added this little wrist strap, because I like when project bags have straps, partly because I have to carry a bunch of crap upstairs every week to film this podcast. Um, 
and it's easier to carry if you can just throw a bunch of straps on your wrist and then you know you grab your teapot in one hand and your laptop in the other and um, and you head on up so yeah I so I just finished this today as you can tell I had a bit of a marathon session today of trying to finish things um, here you can see some of the imprecision that makes me not love it. Um, so the fact that I just finished this, I think, is part of the reason why I'm a little bit down on it. Like, I feel like I'm being kind of negative about it. And I think it's just that I was getting frustrated with various things that weren't coming out as well as I'd like them to. And um, little places, you know, like here, you can see it's just a little bit bunchy around the zipper, that kind of thing. I'd like to say I'm not a very experienced <laughs> sewist, um, but I've been sewing for a long time. I've just never sewed very consistently or had any real in, um, like formal instruction. So I think I get a lot of the concepts, but I don't necessarily like take all of the precautions you should take to make things um, work as well as they should work. So like I said, on my second on my second go, I think I'm gonna be a little bit more precise. And I am I am warming up to this bag. I'm I'm starting to love it even in its imperfection. <laughs> I still love the concept of course. I think it is the perfect size for socks and I needed another sock project bag because as you've seen for a while now I've just had my husband's socks in the canvas that came with my fringe supply Hey, shh, we're recording a podcast right now. I've needed another sock bag because as you've seen for a while, I've been just carrying around my husband's socks in the canvas bag that my fringe supply field bag came in, which speaking of which, let's move into whips. So this is the bag I was mentioning. Um, you know, whatever works. This is my only whip that I've been working on this week, obviously. Um, a lot of my time was spent finishing up this guy and also I didn't get in as much knitting this week as I often do. Um, so this is Knit Picks Felici in Beyond the Wall. You've seen it before so I'm not going to go on and on. Just made a tiny little bit of progress. It's my kind of on the go sock. Um, vanilla. For him I'm doing 2.5 inch needles and 60 stitches cast on. As I mentioned I was going to, I have measured this on his actual foot in the gusset area to determine if I thought he would need a heel flap and gusset or just a fish lips kiss heel. Um, and it fits great so I think I'm just going to do a fish lips kiss heel. I'm sorry my cat keeps making so much noise. I'm trying to get him to get into my lap but he doesn't want to. Um, honey, come here. So as I mentioned, I was going to measure the sock around my um, husband's foot around the gusset area to try to determine if he would need a heel flap and gusset or if he would be okay with just a fish lips kiss heel because I'm still trying to figure out the perfect fit on his socks. And it fit really well, so I think I'm going to just go with the fish lips kiss heel because like I said, he kind of has a large gusset area like a high instep but he also has a small heel so it's been um, a bit of a question so we're going to try that see how that goes I'm almost to that point um, but I haven't been knitting on it very much this week because like I said it's just been my kind of on the go project so for on the horizon I don't really have anything new to show you um, or to talk about I've been planning on starting the film cardigan but I wanted to get this off the needles first um, kind of was counting this as like my garment since I, of course, also have my, um, my Ashburn. Wow, it's been so long since I've worked on it. I don't remember what it's called. Um, so I need to work on that again. But, uh, I'll start the flum sometime soon. It's time to start my March, uh, pattern socks, my Renesme socks. I should be getting going on those. Those are both things I thought I might start this week, but I, like I said, I just haven't had as much knitting time. So that'll probably be coming up this week. Um, and then I want to talk a tiny bit about dream knitting. So this is different than on the horizon for me in that this is where I'd like to mention when it's relevant 
any kind of new patterns or something that I found that I'm excited about doing but not necessarily right away. It's just sort of a nice little dream knitting thing. And I don't know uh, if any of you are on the Quince & Co. newsletter, email newsletter, which um, I probably should cancel because, you know, nobody needs to get newsletters to remind them of things they want to buy. But um, I ended up on it somehow. <laughs> somehow, by buying yarn, I ended up on it because I bought yarn. Um, and if you are on it, then you know that this week they released a collection of patterns called the Linen Noir Collection. It was five different patterns using their linen yarn, um, and they were all done in black, you know, so very gorgeous. And there was a lot of nice variety. They were all very light, as you can imagine. There was a cardigan. There was kind of a boxy three-quarter length sleeve t-shirt. There was sort of more of a cap sleeve t-shirt that had some nice lace detailing in the middle. Um, there was a sleeveless sort of short dress or tunic and uh, something else like a plain long sleeve t-shirt, something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And I love them all. I favorited them all. Um, I can totally see myself knitting all of them and I'm right now because spring is kind of popping up around here. I've been very much in the mindset of lighter things, knitted t-shirts and blouses and knitting in linen and silk and all of those lovely thin drapey fabrics. I've got some stuff uh, planned to do with that soon and these were just very much in that mindset. Um, so I marked all of them and I would love to do any of them in the near future. I was really enjoying getting a new email every week and seeing what the latest linen noir pattern was because I loved them all. All right, it's time to get into stash enhancement, which means I'm probably gonna have to put this cat down. Oh, there he goes. Great. Okay, good job. Wow, you are, you're a little bit disruptive. Has anyone ever told you that? Let's start with the least interesting and move our way up. So our first thing that I have is not yarn. <laughs> it is some pom-pom makers um, and they have been opened, but I'm still just keep, Augie, really? Can we can we try to not get in the camera? Okay, thank you. Um, so I <laughs> so we're gonna try and do this with him in my lap. He's very needy right now, and very furry. He's shedding because it's springtime. Um, so I have actually opened these. I used the smallest one for the cotton tails on the um, hop slots, uh, but I'm just kind of keeping them in their packaging right now. I just got them on Amazon for a really cheap price. Um, that's the brand. Uh, they had terrible instructions that were impossible to read. It took me like three times to do it correctly. Um, but once you do it correctly, it's like a very easy way to make um, consistently sized pom-poms and certainly faster than having to create your own little thing. and. Um, so I figured I needed to get these eventually and I used the hops a lot as an excuse for when to get them. So I'm gonna go up there now. Are you? I don't think you can make it from there. You're not as young as you used to be, Augie. Okay, don't get on the keyboard. Oh my God, this cat. Uh, so yeah, so they were really cheap and a nice addition to my, my tools. This freaking cat. He's being really bad right now. You cannot hit the camera with your tail. Oh my God. Okay. Now we're gonna work our way up toward the most exciting. I have three types of yarn to show you. And when the first one is Quince & Co, you know there's some exciting yarn. These are two skeins. I actually have 11. Uh, this is Owl, and the colorway is Tito or Tito. Um, it isn't undyed, so it just naturally comes off the sheep in this lovely sandy color. And it is super soft, very squishy. Um, Owl, if you don't know, is 50% wool, 50% alpaca, and I believe worsted. 
weight. This is for the Flom cardigan. Um, as you saw, if you've been following along, I went to one of my local yarn stores that carries Quince & Co, but they didn't carry the Owls. So then I decided to order it, and I was going back and forth about what colors I wanted to get. Um, I've got this brightness over here now because now he's poking his head out the window and the shades are open and it's just chaos around here right now. It's it's cool. Um, so anyway, very excited to get these caked up and start on that cardigan now that I have finished my trusty little meandering here and I can give that my full attention. So beautiful. Uh, okay, so the next thing... Remember I told you there was some hedgehog fibers coming from Miss Foss Tricot in Montreal um, for a Marley Shaw. So I got two skeins of each. I'll just show you one skein because, you know, obviously it's all about the, the colorway. One skein of each. So these are going to work together in a brioche shawl. And I'll show them to you one at a time now. This one is just called Coral. And it's a lovely, uh, this is on the skinny singles base, if you can't tell. Um, fingering weight, of course. So this is a lovely tonal, very bright coral color, which I love. And then this is the one that I really fell in love with. And then I was looking for, okay, well, what's going to be the perfect tonal to bring that out? And I decided the coral was. Um, but this one just blew my mind. This is called Bramble. And I just really love where you can see there, like the complexity in those speckles, how many colors, and yet it really has a subtle look to it because it's mostly this nice cream color. Um, just really gorgeous, really gorgeous. I could do an entire sweater out of this, absolutely without like no question. So I've got two of each of those. And um, I don't know when exactly I'll be starting on the Marley. There's some other things I need to prioritize right now. Um, but, you know, when I'm starting to itch for some more brioche, I'm sure they'll be coming out sometime soon. Hopefully I can get that ash burn off the needles and then I'll stop feeling so much guilt. And the final and arguably most exciting bit of yarn I have to share is the second installment in the Homespun House Local Yarn Club. So this was, of course, the first installment here. Um, so if you're in that club, you're going to want to look away, and I'll tell you when. Um, and I won't say any actual color words, but I am going to say the name of the colorway. Um, actually, why don't I just flash the name of the colorway up in text when I'm showing it that way? Anybody out there who might be expecting this doesn't have to worry. Um, so let's see. If you're unfamiliar, Molly from a homespun house is living in Germany. Um, and uh, she's originally from America, but she, her husband is German. Um, so she's been in Germany for a long time. And um, she is doing this local yarn club where she has non-superwash wool from a local... Um, farm or ranch or whatever you would call it and it's all like family owned and um, processed in her area and it's just gorgeous it is very sheepy and just smells lovely it's a little bit more rustic but it is certainly not itchy at all um, and it's just it's just really gorgeous I really really enjoyed working with it uh, in the meandering, so I'm super excited about this new one. Um, the base color on this is one of my very favorite colors in the world, and uh, I just think it's really subtle and gorgeous. So I'm going to show it to you now. Look away if you don't want to see it, and I'll tell you when to look back. So you can see it's much more subtle in a way than the other one. Um, the name is on the screen in text, and it of course came with this sterling silver progress keeper, which I probably can't show you properly or describe 
what it is. Maybe I can give you a good angle on it. Okay, let me just take up, let me just open the package. This is crazy. There, you can see it. So I am obviously very, very, very excited about that. And we'll see what that gets turned into. It'll have to be something very special like the other local yarn club installment was. Um, maybe we'll see what the third installment is and maybe the second and the third will want to play together. I don't know. Or maybe it'll just hit me like it did with the meandering shawl. Um, you can look now, by the way. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. You can look now. Um, so yeah, that'll be exciting to see what I want to do with that. So before we get into chit chat, I want to talk to you a little bit about my knitting goals for the year. And I know that we're like halfway through March, so it's kind of a funny time to do it. But it just got me thinking because of my giveaway, how that was my prompt for you guys and you had such awesome answers. Um, I thought, why don't I share what I've kind of been thinking about for my knitting goals for this year. So I have a lot of them, <laughs> um, but I'm just going to speed through them for you here. Uh, some of them you will already be familiar with, like how I want to knit two pairs of socks every month, one patterned and one vanilla. vanilla. Uh, I've been keeping up with that okay so far, although I haven't started my patterned March socks and we're halfway through March, so um, I really need to get on that if I'm going to keep up. Uh, I would also like to knit six garments for myself. They won't all be sweaters. Some of them will be uh, summery garments. I'd also like to start experimenting with hand dyeing this year. Uh, I haven't done anything to get going in that department. Um, so it's possible that that's going to get delayed further, but I, that is definitely a goal of mine. Um, I'd like to keep up with my Cozy Memories blanket and my uh, Beekeeper's quilt. Um, I'd like to knit at least one everyday hat, so that's going to come in the fall, um, since we aren't really having super cold weather now. But as I've mentioned before, I, I don't really have a hat that I knit for myself that's like a good everyday hat. Uh, I would like to knit, in addition to the socks for myself that I mentioned, I'd like to knit a pair of socks, at least one pair for my husband, my mother, and my father. So I'm partway through the ones for my husband, so going on that. Um, I would like to make a sweater for one of my friend's babies who is due in the summer and I have that picked out. Uh, and finally, I had as a goal this year that I wanted to make a project bag, which I've already done. <laughs> so those are my goals for 2017, knitting related. All right, now it is time for chit chat. So I'm gonna pull out my socks and kick back. And let's talk about what's going on. Um, so as I mentioned before, I decided to try veganism for Lent. Um, I am not a religious person. I'm not Catholic. Um, my in-laws are Catholic and my father was raised Catholic. Um, but I just sort of chose Lent because it felt like a less arbitrary time. Um, and this is something that I've been wanting to try out since I read uh, Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer in about like September or October. Um, so I was actually a vegetarian from the age of seven until I was 20. And then I started gradually reintroducing um, meat into my diet. Uh, and all of it is, you know, they're all very complicated reasons and sort of personal reasons and things. So I don't really want to get into a big chat about why I gave it up and why I started doing it again and, you know, why I am not going vegan permanently and any of that stuff. That's a, that's a, um, you know, an important conversation to have and it's a conversation that is worthy of being had, but I think it just gets into some stuff that is, um, a little bit difficult, it, a little bit difficult to talk about and just sort of one level more, um, in depth than I think is appropriate for just like a chit chat segment on this podcast that doesn't really have anything to do with this. So I kind of just want to share uh, for, for in this context, like my experience with it, rather than talking really in depth about like my reasoning, because I think it's a very personal thing. Um, so my experience so far, I have now been vegan for 
this will be my 12th day. Um, today is my, you know, when it's over will be my 12th full day. And that's out of 40 days. Um, so that's actually makes me feel like I've gone a lot. I, I've done, a, I'm a lot further into it than it feels like. It feels like I'm at the beginning. It has been more challenging in certain ways and less challenging in certain ways than I thought. So like one thing that I thought was gonna be more of a challenge was planning ahead and making sure I always had an option and um, you know, never getting like stuck in a situation where I was starving, there was nothing to eat. Now granted, I haven't done any of the really difficult stuff like traveling um, while vegan or you know, going to a dinner party at someone else's house or something like that. I've definitely arranged my <laughs> life to where this is sort of more, it's, it's a pretty convenient time for me to be doing this. Um, and I know that's a privilege. Also, uh, so the, the most, the most out of control of my own, of like making the decisions myself that I've had to be so far, uh, were two different occasions. One, I had a team lunch with my, um, my team at work. And for that, I just said, like, we, you know, we always decide where we're going to go to lunch. And a lot of people like to go to Potbelly. God knows why. I'll never understand that. Um, but people are very into Potbelly. And I knew that there were a lot of places in the area that I could find something vegan. But Potbelly was not one where I was going to be able to find a very good option. There's definitely a way you can be like, oh, the salad without the cheese or like, but it's just not, it's not something that's going to be like the best. Um, so I was kind of thinking... You know, I could say nothing um, and just let people make their own decision, but then I'll probably end up at Pop Belly, but like I don't want to inconvenience other people. So what I ended up saying was as we were deciding where to go, I just sort of made a joke of it and I said, um, I'm going to say two seemingly contradictory things. I'm up for anything and I'm vegan right now. <laughs> and everyone kind of laughed and then it became a conversation and we ended up going to this great um, sushi place that we have locally that's like the Chipotle of sushi so you point at stuff in front of you and they're actually a great place to be vegan because they have a tofu option instead of fish and they have a ton of vegetables and like seaweed salad and I mean it's like actually a really really good vegan option so um there were there's actually a ton of great vegan options when you actually get down to it I mean most like regular fast food there isn't, but a lot of fast casual places there are. So like Chipotle is a super easy place to be vegan. You can get something very filling and delicious um, if you're vegan. And you know, most most places that are not super old fashioned are that way. Um, the, uh, the one other time when I didn't really have much control was last night. I told you I was eating pasta with marinara sauce. Um, this was a family dinner and it's really weird because my mother is vegan, but she's always just like never trying to inconvenience other people. So we were going out to celebrate my brother getting this um, really great and competitive full-time internship this summer and uh, where he's going to be doing business analytics for the city of Cincinnati, which is like so exciting. I'm so happy for him. Um, he's going, he, he's back in school. Um, he's in his 30s and he is a father of two and he's been going back to school and working and being a dad all at the same time um, and I'm just really really proud of him for like going back to school and kicking butt at it and like getting all A's and being a student ambassador and like really embracing it and uh, and now that he's about to graduate and he's like moving toward what's he gonna do when he gets out of school um, he's like really kicking butt at all of that too. So it was, it was great to go out. Um, I got to see my niece and nephew who I haven't seen, whom I haven't seen in a while. Um, but my mother suggested Buca di Beppo, uh, which like I said, it's funny because she's vegan. Um, Buca di Beppo has like the only vegan thing on the menu. Like n all of the salads have cheese. All of the appetizers have cheese and can't even be made without cheese. Like we asked if the bris bruschetta could be made without cheese, which why does bruschetta even have cheese in it? I don't know. But they couldn't because it was like mixed into the mix. Um, so the only thing you can get is pasta with marinara sauce. Now luckily we could add a bunch of vegetables in red pepper and garlic and stuff to that. So it was totally delicious. Um, and we also had them bring out a salad without cheese that was pretty good too. 
but you know pretty limited options because the menu has like 45 things on it and like you know one of them is vegan so with two of the four adults there being vegan didn't make a ton of sense as a place to eat um, but you know she was trying to figure out what would be a good place for a group or you know whatever um, so that was the only other time like I said that in the team lunch that I sort of didn't feel like I had control um, as much control as I would have liked over what I was eating and both times it worked out fine I was fine I had something delicious and filling and it wasn't a big deal it didn't create like a difficult social situation it was just fine um, and then I've had a lot of really fun uh, experiences trying things that I wouldn't normally try so we had our game night last night if you hear a constant tapping that's my cat's tail sorry about that we had a game night not last night um Friday night at our house which we do every so often and we always order pizza um, so I just ordered cheeseless pizza for me we had a pizza that was half um, you know, one of the pizzas of the several pizzas that we got, we had half cheeseless um, and still had toppings. And it's from my favorite pizza restaurant. It's a local place called Adriatico's and they have a very, very garlicky crust and a very delicious spicy pizza sauce. So it was not lacking for flavor at all. I was actually blown away by how freaking delicious it was. Like, not that I would ever prefer it to cheese pizza, um, but it was like when you think pizza without cheese, you feel like you're really compromising, right? That sounds like it's going to be half as delicious as pizza. And it was honestly like 80% as delicious as regular pizza, which was way above my expectations. So I was pretty psyched about that, not just in the moment, but also to know that for the next five weeks that I'm doing this, um, anytime that I'm craving pizza, I can get that and it will be pretty much satisfying to those cravings um, and any kind of social situation where people are ordering pizza I can have that option of like could we get one of them um, half cheeseless or could I get a smaller one half cheeseless or whatever uh, just knowing that that's a good option is a nice discovery now in terms of the more negative side of things um, Vegan cheese is gross, y'all. It's like, it's disgusting. <laughs> and when I say that, I don't mean like, I don't mean like the kind of thing that is that doesn't even taste like cheese. Like, okay, let me explain this. Like a vegan mac and cheese that you get at a restaurant has this nice creamy sauce that's made with nutritional yeast and uh, cashews and it's freaking delicious. Now, I don't think it tastes anything like cheese. I actually like it more than mac and cheese. It's one of my favorite foods. I think it's so freaking good. But like Daya brand cheese slices or grated cheese or anything like that it's just not it's just not good um, I've heard that for a long time from vegans so I've never tried it I eat meat substitutes all the time I eat lots of plant milks um, you know like nut milks and, and soy milk and coconut milk but I never tried vegan cheese because I always heard from vegans that it's gross um, so then I thought, okay, the cheese is going to be the real challenge for me. That's what I'm really going to miss. Uh, so maybe I should try it. And uh, I had like the tiniest little piece of the corner of a slice of diet cheddar cheese. And it made me want to throw up. I couldn't handle it. So I was just like, I wanted to experiment more, but I was so upset by that that I didn't so like one thing I was thinking about was there's actually because I live in the cool neighborhood um, there is a vegan pizza place that delivers vegan cheese made with or vegan pizza made with Daya shredded cheese on it that would have been an option for game night but I thought you know what I'd rather just have cheeseless pizza from a place that I know makes delicious pizza and like I'm I'm curious about those options but I just I dipped my toe in and it was it was a very rude awakening, so I just don't think that I'm, don't think I'm going to be ready to try any more vegan cheese anytime soon, to be honest. Um, a big part of why I'm doing this is I really wanted to get a real world sense of how big of a sacrifice veganism 
would be for me if I were to do something like that permanently because I want to be really intentional about my decisions and I I'm the kind of person like I don't eat um, meat all that much and I will quite frequently have like uh, a day that's totally vegan until dinner you know like a vegan breakfast vegan lunch situation I'll get soy milk in my coffee I'll make those kind of small decisions um, but if I'm gonna make the decision to still eat dairy sometimes and even meat sometimes um, I feel like it's it's really important that I know what that decision is not just in terms of the consequences that it has on the planet and on the lives of animals and you know all of the many consequences it has in my own health etc but that I know that the thing that I'm choosing not to do, which is to be a full-time, all-the-time vegan, that I know what that actually looks like, that I don't have in my mind an idea of something that's more difficult than it really would be, or less difficult than it really would be. I, I want every day that I'm making my decisions to, to have a real understanding of what those experiences are. And I think, you know, I can't sit around and say, uh, the sacrifice of being a full-time, all-the-time vegan isn't worth it, you know, for my personal happiness weighed against the difference I would be making in that decision. I've decided that for now I'm going to continue to eat animal products. I can't really say that if I don't know what being a vegan full-time actually feels like. So I thought six weeks was a really good period of time to get a sense of how that would actually feel because you know you do like a week and you don't really know what it feels like to be craving the heck out of some cheese and not able to eat cheese um, you don't really have a good sense of that after a week and you don't really have a good sense of how frequently you're going to be in social situations that are going to be um, affected in some way by your diet and you know just Etc. Etc. Or or even how your body's going to react to it, and I feel like that's been really positive for me. At first, I was having trouble. I was not eating enough food, um, and I was getting like hangry by the end of the day, um, which I have a real uh, a real um, susceptibility to getting hangry. Uh, I spent a good deal of my life like crash dieting and um, just just not feeding myself all the food that I needed to eat. Um, I, yeah, I've had some um, sort of disordered eating type struggles uh, in the past and I know that it is important to my happiness and my relationships with other people and my work and all of that um, for me to eat enough food <laughs> let's put it that way because I've I've eaten not enough food in the past a lot and um, and my life is a lot better when I eat enough food <laughs> uh, and when I first started this vegan diet I was I think I was like assessing the amount of food I was by how large the portions were and it seemed like enough but because I was eating all plant-based foods it, it, it was like, it seemed like it was more food than it actually was. Um, and so I've kind of had to make those adjustments and like take a snack to work in addition to lunch and just like make sure that I'm eating enough. Um, but that was relatively easy to adjust to. Um, and I'm definitely eating more vegetable. Well, I'm not eating a ton more vegetables than I was already because I'm already pretty good about that. Um, but I am eating more. Um, I'm getting more fiber in general, I think, and more than anything, I think I'm eating less fat. Uh, and that's something that I've noticed a difference in in my digestion, um, which I won't go into detail because that's disgusting. <laughs> uh, but it makes sense that cutting out dairy would um, substantially reduce the amount of fat that you're eating. Um, because I think that in a typical American diet, a lot of the fat that you're eating is either going to come from meat or in my case, when I don't eat that much meat, it's going to come from cheese most of the time. 
Um, and so when you cut out all the cheese and all the meat and all the ice cream and all the, you know, everything else, um, I just think I'm eating a substantially less, substantially less fat. And I have noticed that that makes me feel kind of generally better. It makes my digestion better. It feels like a good choice for me. And I think that people can very easily get into a place where they're eating way too little fat. I mean, you need to remember that fat is a way of staying satiated and there are healthy fats and unhealthy fats. And, you know, there was a time when fat was really overly demonized. And I, I don't think that you should be just like never eating nuts or avocado or like trying to live some kind of crash low fat diet. But I do think that after this, I'm probably gonna be a little bit more um, aware of like what percent of my caloric intake is coming from fat and um, and maybe using more moderation when it comes to those choices and trying to eat more of the healthier plant-based fats. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But those are pretty much my big takeaways from the experience right now. Like I said, I'm really early into it, so maybe I'll give you guys a bit of an update toward the end. Um, and yeah, uh, I guess that's all I have to talk about this week for chit chat. Um, there's other stuff going on, but I don't want to keep you guys too long. Um, so. Like I said earlier, we're going to have a new knit along coming up that I'm co-hosting with people. So that's going to be really exciting. Make sure you tune in next week for that announcement and um, lots of fun stuff coming up. Thank you to all of the new re and returning viewers. And um, I will see you guys next week. Uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't yet. And thank you so much for watching.